Well, welcome everybody. Thanks for making it out to Grace this weekend and welcome everybody at the Montrose building as well as everybody watching online. Thanks for tuning in to us this weekend. Uh, before I jump into our conversation for the weekend, I want to draw your attention to a big event that's coming up and uh, we're starting to talk about this. You'll see things passed out. Uh, in the building, and then you'll see it also kind of light up on social media. And we're going to have something at Grace Church that we're calling, ready? This is real creative, ready? The Big Event. So we want you guys to come to the big event. And uh, I would love it if you would write down on your calendars February 22nd, February 22nd, about a month or so from now, uh, we want to have a campus-wide party. And uh, we were looking and saying, man, wouldn't it be fun to be together? Everybody who watches online, as well as Fuel and the Montrose Building, and then the four services, Saturday nights and Sunday mornings here uh, at the Gent Road Building. It's been a long, long time since we've been able to be together as a church family and just kind of enjoy those relationships and hang out a little bit. So we wanted to have a party where we could do that and we could connect and be together, have tons of stuff for the kids, lots of fun for the adults as well, and just kind of connect a little bit. Uh, we wanted to do it in February. And I don't know if you noticed, but the weather gets bad around here. And so what we decided to do was to take it inside. So on February 22nd, that's a Friday night, we have rented out the John S. Knight Center, and we're going to go down there and just take over the whole convention center. There'll be parking. There's all kinds of stuff online with restaurant discounts and things like that that you can check into. If you go to our websites, you can find links to the big event. And I would love it and appreciate it if you would put that on your calendar. You got nothing else going on any better than this on February 22nd, I can almost guarantee it. Uh, but if you guys would make time to come to that, bring the kids, bring your grandkids, bring your friends, it's gonna be a great, great time. And all it is is an event, it's a get together. And so we're just gonna enjoy each other and hang out and have a blast and, uh, and have fun being together. So February 22nd, big event, downtown Akron, John S. Knight Center. That's the only place we could find in Summit County where we could get the whole campus under one roof at one time. And so we're going down there to have a, a good time with it and want you to be a part of it, okay? So check out the big event. Well, we've been in a series here these last uh, few weeks that we're calling Finding Our Way Back to God. And uh, in this series, uh, we've been talking about this idea of coming home. And we've defined home as the place in which we are close in the presence of God, that we're connected with God, we're at the place that we're created to be, we're walking with God, we're praying, we're connecting with God's people, we're in God's word, and we're living the life that God has called us to live. And what we've said is that is the inclination of every human being. We're created in the likeness of God, and part of that means that we search for him and that we will not be satisfied as a human being until we have made the connection to God or to Christ that we were created to make. And we said we can, we can do whatever we want to do in life. We can hit big, big home runs, but if our soul is not satisfied in that process, then it'll feel empty even though we have all of the worldly success. If we're at the kind of the bottom of the pit somewhere, life is bad, we're in the valley of shadow of death, that we'll feel hopeless if we're there without Christ. But regardless of our circumstances, no matter where we are, we're created to be close to God. And that's when I feel like I'm home, where I'm at the place that I feel like I need to be. And we said what happens, the Bible tells us, is that we wander away. The book of Isaiah tells us that in Isaiah 53, that we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own ways. We wander off from the place that we were created to be. And when I wander off, what happens is we develop what we've called spiritual amnesia. I know that I knew something, but I can't remember what I forgot. I know that something's missing in my life. Something's not right. Something's not in the place that I want it to be. 
But what is it anyways that I'm missing? And then what happens is we're reminded of it. Uh, we, we get connected or get God in front of us again because of Christmas time, or we hear a song, or we pop in the church, or we're at a service, or something like that. We're with a group of friends that value their relationship with God. And suddenly, because we're reminded of that, we look and say, oh, that's what I needed. That's what I wanted. That's what I've been missing. I, I know that I knew that, but I can't remember what I forgot. And now that I see it again, it reminds me that unless my soul is satisfied, unless I'm connected with God the way that I was created to be connected to him, then, then that's where my life feels at peace. That's where it feels complete. That's where I feel at home, where I'm supposed to be. So we've been talking about this for a few weeks. Last week, we talked about what life really is. John 10, 10, Jesus said, I, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And we said it's not just our biological life, but it's the life of the soul, the Zoe life. That it's a life of satisfaction, a life of completeness, a life of security. It's when my soul is filled up, when it's brought to life by God, that the rest of my life starts to make sense and causes me to be where I want to be. So we started last weekend uh, looking at this, and we've been talking about this idea for a couple weekends, but last weekend we started looking at a specific person in relationship to all this, and that is the person that we call the prodigal son or the lost son. And we started looking at Luke chapter 15. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Luke chapter 15. If you're watching online, you can do that in your Bible, or you can use the Grace Church app. It'll all be written out there. And in Luke chapter 15, we started looking at the prodigal son. He was a person that knew that he knew but couldn't remember what he forgot. He was a person who wandered off from a loving, helpful, supportive father and found himself empty. Even though he had what he wanted and he got what he wanted, it didn't fill his soul the way that he wanted it to. And when we left him last weekend, he had just kind of landed in a dark place. If you look at it, verse 11 of chapter 15 of Luke, Jesus is telling this parable or this metaphor. He says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to the father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had. He set off for a, different, a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, he, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to the citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And we kind of left him there last weekend. He had asked his father to give him his desires, his wants, and his ambition. The father gave him what he wanted. He went off to a distant country. He wasn't running away from oppression or pain or control. He had a loving, supportive father, but he went away from him. He wanted to see what else was out there. There must be something else he wanted to look at. He burned through his money on wild living, and after the money was gone, the friends left immediately, <laughs> and he found himself starving to death, living with the pigs, and no one would help him, and that's where we left him last weekend. He's alone, he's away, he's not close to home or near his father, and he's been abandoned. He can no longer purchase the relationships that he had before. We want to pick up his journey here in verse 15, if you want to read there with me, of Luke 15, or verse 17 of Luke 15, and you see what happens. Verse 16, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Then verse 17, when he came to his senses, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired 
servant. So he's in the pig pen, and he comes to his senses, the Bible says. He finally looks and he says, what am I doing here? When we think about finding our way back home, there's this point that we have to awaken to the reality of our situation. And we talked about that in detail last weekend. If you want to look at that conversation, it's online. But I want to start our new, uh, this weekend's conversation at the, that point, that I have to first awaken to the reality that what I am doing in my life is not working. The choices that I have made, the options that I have come up with, the ideas that I have bought into, the people that I have followed. If I'm living with the pig starving to death and no one will give me anything, there's a point where I must admit that the pigs is not where I was created to live. And why am I here? Now, we call this a lot of things in our culture. We call it rock bottom, right? We call it enough is enough. There's a point that I have to look and say, I I'm done. Why am I here? I don't want to live this way. Why am I doing this when I keep making these decisions and kind of working my life out in this way, and it doesn't work, and it doesn't work, and it doesn't work, and the relationship breaks, the relationship breaks, and the relationship breaks, and the fight in our marriage goes round and round and round and round, and me striking out on my own and going to a distant country, ignoring the place that I got my roots, and I got truth, and I got direction, and I'm with the pigs, Whatever your pig pen is, when you look and say, I have had enough, I've come to my senses, I've had enough, I don't want to be here, enough is enough, it's time for me to make some kind of change. In this reality, I have to come to grips with, with the fact that the, the present state of my situation is a situation spiritually, emotionally, situationally that I am, I am no longer willing or wanting to live with. Things need to change. And what I've noticed over the years in my own life and in and, and people's lives that I've tried to walk with and help is there is a moment, there is a moment when people come to their senses, when they realize I don't have to live this way, I just am. When I was growing up, I'm the youngest of five children. I call myself the blessing. I'm by far my parents' favorite child. And so I kind of grew up that way. And so my older siblings were incredibly jealous of me. I got the looks and the brains and the person. I got it all. And so they were just very, very jealous of me. And I have a sister, my sister Sharon, who is three years older than me. And Sharon and I, I love her a ton, actually. And we, we are very close now. We connect well now. But when we were growing up, we were at the right age span that we were right rivals, right? So that three-year gap just puts you right in there where she's a little bit older and I'm the baby and I'm spoiled and she thinks that way. And so we kind of grow up in this rivalry. And my sister's solution to her jealousy of the wonder of who I am was to be physically violent with me. And so it was a kind of a daily thing that I would get some level of a beating from my big sister, right? And so we get off the school bus. She would race up the front yard. She was bigger than me. She was faster than me. She would go in the door and lock it and not let me in the house. That happened a lot. One time she did that, and I kept ringing the doorbell. She opened the door, came out of the house with a yellow plastic wiffle ball bat, and just beat me in the front yard with it. So there's lots of things like that. Lots of nails, fingernails dug in, all those kind of things. So we kind of grew up that way. And in those years when we were young, we had that little sibling rivalry going on, and it was just the way that we lived, right? It, I would do something, she would be mad, she would beat me up. She would have friends over, I would annoy her and embarrass her in some way. And we just had this conflict going back and forth, but she was bigger than me, so she always was in this position of power. I will never forget the day. I remember it like it was yesterday, that we were in one of our conflicts, and I was bugging her, and she was beating me, 
and we were going back and forth. And I remember she would take her fingernails and she would dig at me, right? Like all junior high girls do. And so she would, she was digging at me and kind of clawing at me. And to protect my face, I spun over on the ground and I buried my face in the carpet and kind of covered my face like this as she was attacking me like a honey badger. And this was happening. And so as my sister was attacking me, I'll never forget this. I remember coming to my senses. I remember laying there and I remember thinking, I could just stand up if I wanted to. I could just stand up if I wanted to. And what had happened is I had grown, she had not, but all of our habits were happening the same way. And she was on my back and I kind of did a push up and I stood up and she fell off my back and I turned around and looked at her and she has not clawed me since, right? It was that come to your senses. Why am I doing this? I don't have to do it. I'm just used to doing it. Why is my life playing out this way? It didn't have to play out this way anymore. There might have been a time when, when something happened, a relationship broke, an addiction got out of control. Something went on that got me to my, my pig pen. But I don't have to live this way. I'm just living this way, see? That's what happened to the lost son. He came to his senses. Why am I doing this? I'm starving to death. All of my friends have abandoned me. I have no money. I don't have to live this way. I'm just living this way. Enough's enough. He came to his senses. I have a father who loves me. I have a father who can provide for me. He provides better for his servants than what I'm living right now. Why would I live this way? Why wouldn't I decide to go to my father? And guys, listen, th this, is, this is big in this whole conversation. If you want to find your way back to God, there, there's some level of a realization like this that has to hit in your life because it motivates us to change our life, to go home to our Father. Why is our marriage this way? It just is. We just fight. We just function like roommates. There's no intimacy. It just is that way. It's just been that way. It doesn't have to be. There's all kinds of help. There's all kinds of... Why is it that way? Why do I cover the secret sin? Because I just cover it. I'm just used to hiding it. I just kind of gave up working on it. Why am I a rebellious teenager? What are you rebelling against? Because I just rebel. But why? Why are you living that way? Why haven't you mended that relationship? Because we, we quit talking years ago. You're the same person a decade later that you were? Why don't... Because we just don't. We don't have to live that way. There's not a rule that says we live that way. We're just used to the pig pen. And if we're not careful, the pig sty can become home. See? The lost son came to his senses. And he, he, he woke up. I, I have nobody. I have nothing. I'm starving to death, I don't like my life, and I have a father who loves me and at a minimum would accept me as a servant. Why am I here? Why don't I go there? Now something fascinating happens. When he comes to his senses and he comes to that realization, I want you to see this. He starts to think, I think, the way that many of us think. Verse 17, he came to his senses, and he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I'm starving to death? And he makes this decision, I will set out and go back to my father, and then he does something. He starts to daydream and to, to, to idealize what that reunion with his father might be like. 
I, I don't want to be here, and I know I can go there. When I go there, what's it going to be like when I get there? How's my father going to respond? Because remember, he left. He went to the distant country. He looked at his dad and said, I just wish you were dead. I just give me the money. He went out. He squandered things on wild living. His dad never cut him off. His dad never kicked him out. I don't want to be here. I think I'll go there. But what is, what is dad going to be like when I get there? I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, he, he makes this scenario up. This is what I'll say to him. I know what I'll say. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. I, I know, you know what I'll do? When I, get, when I see my dad, I'll grovel. That's what I'll do. And when I grovel, I'll say, I, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. You don't even have to call me your son. If you could just feed me like one of the servants, that, that's how I'm going to fantasize that reunion. And I'm going to daydream what that will be about, right? This is what happens. When we find ourselves in our pigsty and we wake up, to the reality of where we're at and why we're here, and we come to our senses and say, well, I don't, I don't want to even want to live here, and I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust the heart and the mind of God. I'm going to go back to God. I'm going to find my way home. I've come to my senses. We will kind of daydream or think through how God is going to interact with us when we're there. Now, this, this is huge. Because how I view or how I think through that interaction is going to determine directly how I approach God. We talk about this sometimes at Grace, and we say we think that there's three main ways that people hear God or imagine what God is going to be like. We say that oftentimes we, we think of God as an inspecting God, that God is looking at my life and he's looking for the failure in my life and God is watching, he's always watching, right? He, he's looking and he's going to find the thing that's wrong with me. Now, if I believe that my heavenly father is gonna be like that, when I think about going home, that's the scenario I'll run. I'll go back to God and I'll tell God, look, God, I quit smoking and I quit drinking and I quit chewing and I quit dating girls who do and I quit cheering for Michigan. I quit doing all the things that you hate so much and, and I'm not doing that anymore. If I, if I get my act together, will you let me come home? And many of us think that way about God. I have to stop everything I'm doing wrong so I can prove to God I'm worthy to come to the place I was created to be. It's very, very difficult to get out of the pig pen and to knock off everything I've ever done and to get back to God, right? Because I gotta pass inspection. We say sometimes we hear God as an inspecting God. Oftentimes we hear God as a disappointed God. And when we say, I've had enough, I'm going to go back to God, what's my father going to be like? He's going to have his arms crossed, he's going to be shaking his head. So I'm going to grovel my way back to God. God, if you will just keep me out of hell and like don't make me get sick and like just kind of help me a little bit, I will serve you. I will tithe 90% of my money. I will go to the mission field. I will sign up for to work with the junior high kids. I'll do all of it, God. You Just anything. And we'll grovel to God because God's shaking his head. That, it, it, you're that one. You're the dumb kid who left home. See? Weren't you raised in church? You know better. Then your when your grandma then your grandma tell you not to do it. Dummy. Have you never read the Bible? It's right there. And if I hear God as that disappointed God and He's got His arms crossed, then I'll create my path home and, and it, it's maybe he'll take me or maybe the church burning building will burn down if I get out of my pigsty. Say so we hear God a lot as an inspecting God 
as a disappointed God and then as, as a distant God. God is out there somewhere, and if I view God as out there somewhere, what I will do is I will become religious because I'm trying to appease this all-powerful God and get him not to zap me. So I'm going to get myself out of my pig pen and what I'm going to do is I'm going to get into church. I got to go to confession. I got to get to church. I got to start working. I got to start serving. I got to show up no matter how bad the weather is. I got to, I got to do all that kind of stuff. I got to make, I'm going to know that I'm going to sing the songs without looking at the screens. I'm going to memorize everything in the Bible. I'm going to be some version of a monk or a nun because I have to appease God, especially considering what I did to him. See? And this is what the lost son is doing. I'm going to go back to my father. That's where I need to be. But, but I, I, I'm going to have to, this is probably how he'll respond to me. And so these are the things that I'm going to say to him. And what we say here at Grace a lot is God is not an inspecting God. He's not a disappointed God. He's not a distant God. He's a loving God who will welcome you home. And so it is in heaven that when the lost sheep is found, heaven rejoices. And so it is in heaven when the lost coin is found, heaven rejoices. And so it is in heaven when the lost son comes home, heaven rejoices. I was talking to a friend this week about all of this, and he asked me a great question. He said, uh, he said Jeff, I, I, get, I get what you're saying, right, that, that Jesus wants us to come home and you're never too far from God and he'll rejoice when, he, when you decide to turn your heart and all those kind of things. He was, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but he kind of said those kind of things. But then he looked at me and he said, he said I, I, I am open to like believing what you're saying. He said, but what am I supposed to do? What do you do? like, give me a list of things to do. I was like, well, you know, you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. He's like, can you just, like, give me steps? Like, what am I supposed to do? And, and I'm listening to my friend, and I think I understand what he was asking me. And so I want to I wanna show you what to do, right? If you're in the pig pen and you've had enough, and you have come to your senses, and you say, I'm, I'm just going to go home. Who am I going to go home to? I'm going to go home to a loving God who's going to welcome me home. How do, how do I get from the pig pen to my father? What do I do, okay? Here it is. I'm going to show you. Simple as I can make it. I think it'll help a little bit. Here's the first thing. I'm going to trust the character of God. I'm going to trust the character of God. It's fascinating that the lost son trusted his father's heart. It's really fascinating that when he was running his scenarios, when he was fantasizing about that reunion, his minimum solution was I know at a minimum my dad will treat me like one of his servants. He didn't run the scenario. If, if I go home, my dad is going to like sick the hounds on me. He didn't run the scenario. If I go home, what my dad's going to do is he's just going to make me live in the pig pen back at the house to remind me that he told me not to do it. He didn't run the scenario that, that if I go home to my dad, he's going to turn his back on me and not even speak to me. His minimum scenario was if I, if I drag myself home at a minimum, he'll treat me like one of the servants. I, I really believe that one of the hardest things for us to learn and to trust about God is his character, that he is not out to get us. He has decided to love us. He has had every opportunity to get you, every opportunity to condemn you, every opportunity to end all of his grace and send you to hell, directly to hell, don't pass, go. He's had all the opportunity in the world, and he has chosen not to do that. 
and in his character, as we're fantasizing and making up scenarios about what it will be like to go home, we're inputting characteristics about God that he is not true of him. So he's, he's looking for sin in my life, and I better, I gotta get my act together. I gotta, that's not true. He's already found the sin in your life. He knows everything that you do, everything, and he's already chosen to provide a path of forgiveness through his son, Jesus Christ, for you. Well, he's going to be, he's going to be, he's just going to be so disgusted with me. No, your, your righteousness is like filthy rags to him. He's already chosen to forgive you, to justify you, to make you righteous. He's already chosen to do that. He said that. Well, he's just, he's, he's an angry God and I got to appease him. He's not an angry God. He's got plenty of reason to be angry. He's not an angry God. He, he's not pouring out his wrath on the planet right now. He's pouring out his grace and his mercy on the planet right now. We read into God things that God says are not true of him. And then we distrust our invention of his character instead of trusting his clear explanation of his character. If I'm going to leave my, my pig pen and go back to my father, there's a point, guys. It's this simple, ready? I just have to take God at his word. I have to look at what he did. He gave his son. Jesus laid his life down. That's all acts of a loving God. If God wanted to zap you, he would have zapped you. And so I have to trust this boy who wandered away from home, his first inclination that drew him back to his father was trusting the character of his father. I know my father, he's kind, he's generous, he's faithful, he, he's respectful to his servants. I see that played out in his servants. At a minimum, he'll be that way to me. He'll help me in that way. If I was talking to my friend right now and giving him a list, the first thing I would say is you got to trust God's heart because it's his kindness that draws you to repentance. Here's the second thing I would say. You got to move your feet. You got to move your feet. The Bible says that faith without action is dead. Believing that God loves you and believing that God will forgive you and never moving toward that love and forgiveness it, it, it causes you to be at a place where you never embrace it. Saying that God is the, the highest power and that his power is greater than everything and then never taking a step to enact a different life in that power. Somewhere in here, this lost son how to get up out of the muck and the mire and start walking away from the pig pen. He had to make decisions to move forward. He had to make decisions to put his life in a different position, spiritually, emotionally, and in this illustration, physically. I have to say, instead of sitting in the pig pen and daydreaming about what it would be like to go home to my father, there's a point that I actually have to move my feet and start going home to my father. And so I have to start taking taking steps. This is a hard question. I love you, but I'm going to ask you anyways. Ready? Here it is. How long have you been talking about getting out of your pig pen? I mean, weren't you talking about getting out of your pig pen last year? How, how long have you been frustrated in the relational cycles you're in? I've been, I've been so frustrated for five years. All right. And we've done what? We fought. That's helpful. <laughs> right? What, what have we done? How have we moved? What steps have we taken? Fantasizing about being out of the pig pen, talking about how we need to be out of the pig pen, talking about how the whole culture has devolved to the pig pen, it does nothing. Embracing the character of God and then taking steps to enact that character in your life and to act on the opportunity that God has given you, you have to put some movement to your motivation. 
What does that look like? Hyper practical, okay? Here's one. Starting to come to church is a, is a hyper practical thing, and, or dialing in online on a regular basis is a hyper practical thing. I, I, at a minimum, I'm getting some kind of a diet of the Word of God. If I showed up at Christmas and realized that I missed this, then getting back involved in it and tied into it is the, is the logical way to start getting a diet of what you missed. Getting into life groups is a practical thing. I just have such a hard time staying away from my sin. Right. Getting yourself around other people who will invest in you, pray for you, hold you accountable, and provide alternate activities for you. Learning God's word. I just, I feel like God's such a mystery. You, you told me that five years ago. I mean, come on. There's a, there's a point, there's... There's a point where it's a book and it's very accessible. <laughs> See, it's little things like that. I'm going to make a move. I, I just can't get through the pain of my past. Then let's get you into some Christian counseling. Let's make a move on that. I just struggle with this addiction. Then let's get you connected to celebrate recovery. We're just, spur, just spinning in these cycles. Then let's get you tied into these things. That's what the church does. That's what the resources are. That's what friendships are for. But let's not stay here and talk about how we need to not be here. Let's, let's begin to make a move. This was a big part of my conversation with my friend. I feel like, I, well, then let, let's talk about the steps we need to take. And they're not magical, and they're certainly not cure-alls. They're not a silver bullet that's going to make all our problems go away, but they're not the pig pen. And so let's put movement to our motivation. And this kid did this. He, he, he got up, and he headed toward his father. Here's the last one I wrote down. This is one of my favorite things I've ever written down. Ready? You got to trust the character of God. You got to move your feet. Here's the next one. You got to own your odor. <laughs> that awesome. Did you get a tattoo of that one? You got you to gotta own your odor. Okay? Here it is. Ready? Nowhere in this story between the pig pen and the father is there anything about getting cleaned up. He had no money and nobody would help him. So when he walked back into his father's life, he walked back into his father's life in a, in a circumstance that was remarkably like how he left the pig pen. There's no money for new clothes. Remember, this is a child of privilege. So there's no money for new clothes. We don't even know that he took a shower. Maybe he jumped in a river somewhere, but he didn't get a shave and a haircut and a new outfit and some nice shoes, his teeth whitened, his eyebrows done, and then go see his dad. He walked up to his father broken, defeated, worn out, beat up with the clear understanding that as a minimum, if I drag my sorry self back to my dad, at a minimum, he'll treat me like he does his servants. I have to own my odor when it's time to go back to see my father. I have to own my sin. I don't come to God cleaned up I come back to God as the sinner that I am. Not God, I got over, I got over all of my, my sexual impurity. God, I stand in, I'm coming to you as an impure person. God, we fixed our marriage and now we're ready to lead in the church so we're back. God, we're out of options. We have no idea what else to do. God, I overcame my addiction, so now, now that I did that, you, know, you can shoot a video and show it now. God, I, it's raging out of control. I am destroying myself and the people that I 
love. God, I quit rebellion. Oh, man, it's so good. God, I'm that story. At 16, I went off the deep end. Now that I'm 25 and I have a kid, I'm back. God, I, I have been shaking my fist at you and my family for years, and here I am. You got to own your odor. We come to the Father as sinners. We come to the Father broken. We come to the Father messed up. We come to the Father exposing our secrets, not necessarily having victory over them. If we, remember, if we could have got ourselves out of the pig pen and fixed our own life, we would have done that already. The reason I have to go home it's because I need the help of my Father. I, I need what I was created to have. And I can't get it on my own. And so instead of trying to scrub yourself down and fix yourself up, you own it. I'm here as a sinner. I'm here lost. I'm here broken. I'm here helpless. And my, my facade is my facade. I, got, I, I can have a clean, shiny, professional facade, and everybody thinks we're happy, but my soul is dying. Or it, I can, it can be the most obviously broken person on planet Earth. Doesn't matter. Just own your odor. And go home. See? He came to his senses as I'm convinced, trusting the character of God and believing that Christ has already decided to love a, a broken, smelly, sinful person is one of the hardest truths of Scripture we have to get our heads around. I think a lot of times we think that the hard truths of Scripture is, is the, the sins that God preaches against. God doesn't want you to do this and do that. And in a culture today where they don't agree with everything that the church would teach, we think it's so brave and so difficult to say out loud what God obviously says in his Scripture about sin. I don't think those are the hardest truths of Scripture. The hardest truths of Scripture is what God says out loud about the sinner. That I love you. I'm eager to forgive you. I want to restore you. My grace is free. You don't earn it. My mercy is free. You don't deserve it. My acceptance of you is complete. You don't have to quantify it. And if you will come home, if you will repent, turn, turn from the pig pen and come home to your father, I will accept you and love you and we will deal with your sin and we'll deal with your clothes and we'll, that's later on in the story. He didn't leave him where he was at, but he didn't reject him because of where he started. My prayer, I was thinking about this. I, I'm so passionate about this. This is my prayer. Paul prayed this prayer in Ephesians. And this is my prayer for all of us who are stuck in our pig pen and wondering if we should go home or not. This is his prayer, and I want it to be mine too. He says, I pray. This is the Apostle Paul, Ephesians 3. I pray, being rooted and established in love. Rooted and established. Not needing and maybe we'll get you some. Rooted and established in love that, that you have, uh, may have the power together with all Lord's people, ready, to grasp. Isn't that fascinating that he says that? Not to know about, not to hear about, not, not to study the Bible about. But Paul looked, he says, you know, you know what I'm scared about with you guys? I'm scared that you don't grasp. I'm scared that if you're in the pig pen and you want to go home, you won't grasp what the Father is like. You won't grasp that, that just own your odor. You don't clean yourself up first. You go there because you're, you're not cleaned up. That you'll grasp that God empowers steps of faith. My prayer is that you will grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. 
and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Isn't that fascinating? But Jeff, I don't understand. I don't understand how God can love me if I rebelled against his word in the church. Right. It surpasses your knowledge. I don't understand. If God is holy and God is pure and I'm in the pig pen, how can he have mercy and grace on me? Right. It surpasses your knowledge. It, it just is. You're not going to understand it. It's not going to make sense because in the human, a human being, our love is always conditional for each other. Paul says, I, I, my prayer is that you, you can get your head around the enormity of, of the compassion and the grace and the mercy and the desire to forgive that Christ has for you. This love that surpasses knowledge. And he says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. Paul says, listen, if you could understand that, that if you will come to your senses and walk out of the pig pen, that there is a father, he's not inspecting, he, he's not disappointed, he's not distant, he, he is awaiting you. And his love for you is actually bigger and deeper and wider and longer than you can get your head around. And he doesn't want to just straighten you out. He wouldn't want to just smack you on the back of the head and tell you to knock it off. He doesn't want to just throw you in the shower and say, start coming. You need to start going to church. He wants to do immeasurably more than you could ask or imagine. I can't even imagine having a thriving, healthy, happy, sexy marriage. I can't even imagine it. Yeah, that's what Christ wants to do. I can't even imagine not being addicted. I don't even want to ask for that. If you could just like help me out a little bit. I don't even want to, I can't even imagine what that life would be like. I can't even imagine having emotional health. I've been so wounded by my childhood for my whole life. I can't even imagine what it would be like to, to trust people. I can't even I can't even imagine forgiveness. What she did to me, what they did to me, I can't even imagine what it would be like to release that. And Paul says, you know what? The power to break that free in your life is the love of God. And my prayer is that you could grasp it. Because when you understand how deeply God loves you and forgives you and will help you, you will be shocked how you're able to reflect that love to the people around you. He can do immeasurably more than just get you out of a pig pen. He can make you into something new. And it's fascinating. As, as the sun started to get his head around this, look at it. He comes to his senses. He says, I'm gonna set out and go back to my father and, and, and he'll at least treat me like one of his hired servants, verse 20. So he went up, and he got up and he went to his father. What happened? When he went home to his father, something beyond what he was gonna ask or could even imagine happened to him. So he went to his father. Remember, he imagined being treated like a servant. He, he imagined groveling. He got up and he went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his, his father saw him. He was looking for him. He was waiting for him to come home. His father saw him, and who, his father was filled with compassion for him, and he ran to his son, and he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. The father ran to his son. He didn't turn his back. He didn't make him grovel. He, he didn't shut him out. He didn't tell him off. 
He's watching. He's waiting. When he saw his son smelly and gross and skinny and malnourished and almost unrecognizable except to his father, he had compassion. This is the kid that looked at his dad and said, I wish you were dead, just give me the money. This is the kid that squandered the money on wild living. All that he had done, when he decided to come home, he received compassion from his father who ran to him, threw his arms around him, greater than he could have ever asked or imagined, kissed him, said, welcome home. When I come to the point where I've had enough, I've had enough. I don't want to live this way. I don't want to be this way. I trust the heart of God and the mind of God. What's God want to do? God wants to do a miracle. What's to do a miracle in your life? It's got nothing to do with making you healthy, young, or rich. It's got everything to do with doing more than you could ask or imagine. I don't want to clean you up or straighten you out or help you knock it off. I want to restore you to the place you were created to be. I want you to grasp how deeply I love you. And come home. I'm waiting. I'm watching. I'm not even ticked off. I'm grieved that you went away in the first place. And I don't care how you smell, and I don't care how you look, and I don't care what you did. I just want you home. We will deal with all of it. But come home, see. We have to awaken to the reality of where we are in our pigsty. And we have to awaken to the help that we need and that Christ will give us. I need the power of God. I I need the stuff that only God can do. I need the love of God. I need to be home. And the Bible says that when I ask for that help, when I confess my sin, my Father is faithful, just, to forgive me of my sin. Ready? And cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I need the help of God. I need the help of God's people. This is why we come to church. We don't come to church to pay penance to God. We come to church because the body of Christ is alive. It's a spiritual thing. We need each other. This is why we go to life group. We don't go to life group because we don't have anything to do on a Tuesday. We go to life group because I need like-minded people to help spur me on to love and good deeds. This is why we go to celebrate recovery. Because a higher power isn't what we need. The higher power, Christ, is who we need. This is why we go to youth group. This is why we do it all. That's why God created it all. But I got to trust the character of God. I got to put movement to my motivation. I own my odor. And when I do, when I head out toward home, my heavenly Father is watching. He's waiting. He'll view me with compassion, not contempt. And he will run out to greet me. The band's going to come out, and they're going to lead us in a time of reflection and thought. And here's the prayer that I might encourage you to pray. Ready? God, if you're real, ready? God, if you're real, will you help me? God, if you're real, will you help me? I need help. 
I'm stuck. I don't want to be here. I never meant to get here. I didn't set out to do this. I wandered away. Will you change me? Will you empower me? Will you heal me? Will you forgive me? Will you help me? I'm ready to come home. Jesus, would you interact with us this way, even this weekend? In the deepest parts of our soul, God, this, this is it. We're all, we're all like sheep have gone astray, so we're all in a pig, a pig pen of some sort. It's the nature of it. But God, your love for us, your love that gave your son, Jesus, your love that took you to the cross and kept you there, your love that, that drove even your resurrection, your love that created the church, your love that gave us your Holy Spirit, your love that forgives mercy, grace, compassion. Would you help us to grasp it, to cling to it, to understand it? And God, even in these moments as we're here in this room and we're watching on our screens at home, would you press deep into the secret places of our own heart, to the places where we're stuck, and will you meet us there? Would you make us aware that what we're missing is you? Help us to come to our senses. And then God, through your kindness, help us to get up and head toward home. And these still moments, would you stir in us in these ways, Jesus, in your name.